This video was brought to you by Skillshare. So today, we are taking a look at some viewer submissions and giving our best good faith critiques of their musicianship. People submitted music from all around the world, and we're gonna do our best at helping them get good at music. Our first submission comes from Dustin Pedigo and the Wallace Townsend Quintet, and Dustin submitted a bass solo. So let's do our best to not talk while he's playing. As a bass player, even I know how hard that can be. Killing, man. I know I said that I wouldn't talk over your bass solo, but you know, sometimes I just can't help myself. Something just comes over me whenever I hear a bass solo. It sounds like you guys are playing the tune Nardis by Miles Davis, which is a fairly tricky tune to improvise over and an even trickier tune if you're a bass player. So good job with that. I do kind of like that octave sound on the upright just because it adds a little bit more character to the bass solo. Upright bass solos always end up sounding like a friendly whale trying to talk to you. I know it's mean, but upright bass solos always sound like whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> Uh, but it, it's true though, it, it really is true. One way to move away from the friendly whale sound is to try out different kinds of articulation. It sounds like most of the notes that you're playing are very, very short. Try playing longer notes, try playing more melodically, try to sing a little bit more through the upright bass. If you ever listen to horn players, they'll sometimes just chill on one note for a long period of time. This is like an oversimplification, but one idea that I really like is to articulate all the notes on the beat long and all the notes on the off beats short. still articulate notes very short to help groove with the drummer, but throwing in notes which are a little bit longer makes it feel more like a melody and not really like a bass solo. And in theory, that's the point of a solo, right? You're improvising a new melody around the context of a song. Anyway, thank you so much for your submission. Let's check out the next one, which comes from Tay Grace, who recently worked on an online jam with her friend Will. Nice, okay. Bass line doesn't hit one. It's kind of interesting. <laughs> the get lucky guitar riff. <laughs> Very funky. Funky. Cool, very nice, I like the funky vibes. As a piece of music, it sounds like you're playing with a loop pedal. You start with one phrase, and then you add another phrase, and then you add another phrase, and you build it like that. But you aren't really playing with a loop pedal, right? So the parts can change a little bit more as you're building the arrangement. I feel like maybe you can vary the parts a little bit and improvise within the parts. Like in the drum part, I know you're playing it with the keyboard, so maybe you aren't as facile with coming up with drum parts, but maybe, I don't know, stop playing for a second you'd be surprised at just how effective not playing is before you enter the next section. Also, Tay, as a bass player, I'm interested in hearing how you interact with the drum set and the kick pattern especially. I mean, it doesn't sound like your bass part really matches the drum part. It's fine, it works, and you're playing with good time, but at the same time, I like when the bass and the kick drum are like one unit. That's really the thing that makes it feel like funk. Also, there's one note in your bass line, this one right here. It doesn't quite fit the same rhythmic idea you've been working with, with these nice funky 16th notes. It's a whole note that's just chilling out there, unrelated to the rest of the bass line. I know it sounds like I'm nitpicking here, but the devil is in the details, and I am a bass player, so I'm naturally going to be gravitating towards what the bass player is doing, so. Anyway, thank you so much for your submission, Tay and Will. So next submission comes from Kabir Nankani. 
and Kabir is playing one of Bartok's Romanian folk dances for violin, Movement 6. Let's check out Kabir. Yeah. Love Bartok. Right, man. Yeah, good job. I like your selection of the bar talk. I like the fact that the pianist kind of looks like Pam from The Office, kind of. I'm a huge fan of Bella Bartok. He was a composer that wrote contemporary classical music based on the folk traditions of his native Hungary. And partially because of that, there's this awesome rhythmic drive to Bartok's music. You're doing a pretty good job so far of tapping into that dump ba da dump ba da dump ba da dump ba da dump But the problem that you have right now is the space that you're recording in. The space is very echoey, and so you're not really getting a lot of the transients, those initial attacks of your instrument. Those are smoothed out, and so you don't have the same kind of energy. For certain kinds of music, those smooth transients work beautifully well in really rich reverberant spaces. But when you need to like bring the dance party, the reverb is working against you. So my advice is to really exaggerate the dynamics. Kind of always have to be adapting yourself to the musical space that you're in. That's something that I deal with all the time as a bass player. If I'm in a really reverberant room, a really live room, funky bass lines sound very bad because the notes kind of blur together. Sometimes I have to adapt my bass playing and the note choice that I have and the notes that I'm playing to the actual physical space that I'm in. But anyway, I really do enjoy your playing, so thanks for submitting. Great job. Uh, the next one is gonna be another violin player. I guess this is the violin episode. This is Antoine Fradkin playing Donna Lee. Let's check him out. Very Stefan Grappelli. Nice. Lots of notes. <laughs> Love that diminished look. Great job, man. It's hard to make a violin swing, but you're doing a great job of getting into that, you know, Stefan Grappelli style. It sounds fantastic. One thing that I think you could do a little bit more of, though, is start your phrases on up beats instead of down beats. Right now, you're starting every single melodic idea on a down beat. The only reason why I noticed this is because I used to do that all the time, and then one of my teachers said, hey, instead of dabba dooba dabba dooba, maybe ba dabba dooba dabba dooba. And just that little piece of advice, weirdly, helped me feel a lot freer in my rhythmic choices. So as a violinist, that would just mean starting on the up bow sometimes instead of always starting on the down bow. That might feel a little strange, and you might have to work out some bowings to make it feel more natural, but honestly, I think that helps open up a much wider rhythmic palette for you. But cool. Anyway, thanks for submitting. The next victim is... <laughs> Meow, 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 meow. Erin Snape, who has the goal of writing musicals for a living. She is 16 years old. Give me a person, a smile and a song, so I can talk to you. Come on and talk to me too. I love the book percussion. That's great. Oh man, I love that so much. Thank you so much, Aaron, for sending it in. I love the book percussion, of course. I like the vocal harmonies you did. The chord progression is very evocative with that four to four minor. The melody is a really nice, like, mixolydian thing, like da 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 I mean, I love all the little percussion details, like halfway through the chorus, the book percussion, like, drops down to a four on the floor or, like, a four on the 
cover, whatever. There's a lot of attention to detail here in a song that's fairly simple, but the arrangement is very well thought out. And I know that you wanted help with some arrangement ideas, but the arrangement's very solid already. If you really needed to add stuff, it'd be fun if you continued the pattern of finding household objects and turning it into percussion, like, or like one of these sounds. I'm always a fan of a good ting. And you don't have to create a groove with these sounds, they can just occur at specific moments within the song. This honestly reminds me a lot of what Pomplamoose used to do all the time. One arrangement detail that they did all the time and something that I do all the time is you might want to try, I don't know, experimenting with hitting on two in the chorus. Like cut out the background vocals and the guitar and have like a percussion fill into beat two like this. I mean, I don't know. I'm just having fun with it. I think this is a really, really cool piece of music. It's called Happy, which of course there is already a song by that name. But thank you so much for submitting this. Uh, she has a YouTube channel, Aaron Snape. Go check it out if you like this song. Next one comes from Lucia Sarmiento. Eh. Cowboy Bebop. Uh, cowboy bebop jazz what's not to love this is great the one thing I was thinking is that there's a lot of vibrato on both the Moog and the Iwi and it's that kind of like synth vibrato which is based on an LFO so Lucia I know you can control the vibrato with the Iwi but I was hearing this weird clash I guess in the timbre with the Moog sometimes a couple times you guys harmonized the melody which I think was super cool I think you could have done more with that especially since you're treating both as like two lead voices the arrangements also kind of bare bones like it's just bass and drums and you guys, which is cool, but you know, you might wanna program in some keys or something. Maybe, I don't know, just throwing it out there. But honestly, these things are just super nitpicky. I think it's super awesome. I love the lines that you guys were playing when you were soloing. <sighs> so good. Anyway, let's keep going. The submissions this time around are like, kind of scary good. I'm having trouble trying to figure out, you know, how to give advice to people. Anyway, so this next one is from Luke Reidlinger, and this is a tune called Traffic. Those, those notes on top, those seconds, really sound like car horns. <laughs> Sounds like traffic. Be like a cartoon, Some background music. Awesome, I love that. That's such an evocative use of dissonance to create a real soundscape. It sounds like uh, traffic. The reverberant room, I think, actually plays well with this piece of music. Like that major second dissonance that you keep hitting over and over again sounds nice in the reverb. I think my main piece of advice for you guys here is to play with a little bit more dynamic range. You're kind of blasting the entire time. Hi. Anyway, I started blasting. Bam. And with that in mind, I think these phrases could be shaped. Like almost over exaggerate it, make it cartoony. And if you do that, I feel like it would make the piece come alive more. It's kind of a cartoony piece of music anyway. And by shaping the dynamics like that, I feel like it will help us get into the vibe of the composition even more. Yeah, that's an awesome piece of music. It sounds like traffic. Mission accomplished. Great job. Let's check out the next one, which comes from, this one comes from Guto Doso, and it's an original piece from Brazil. Let's check it out. All right. Odd right, time signature time. Cool. 
cool. I love the fact that you're playing around in an odd time signature. I really like the bass melody. Bass melody, mind you, not a bass solo. Big difference. I think there are a bunch of things you can do to help feel this 5-4 a little bit more. Right now it feels very heavy, like you're counting one, two, three, four, five. If you were to have that same feeling of one, two, three, four, in 4-4, four, four, it wouldn't really groove that much. I think the piano riff, which is just four quarter notes, could be broken up so that you're hitting some off beats and not just on the beat every time. I think that might help. I think also if you kept the motion of down up going in your right arm on the guitar part throughout the entire pattern, even if you're not playing at any given moment, that motion would help keep the time in your body a little bit more. You'd be able to feel the groove over longer periods of time. You're kind of starting and stopping occasionally. Also, the bass part has this little triplet thing occasionally. It's a neat idea, but I think keeping the bass line a little bit simpler and a little bit less busy will help you really lock into the groove. Because the main event is the bass melody, and it's a quite nice bass melody, like I said before. I thought it was good. I just can hear you thinking while you're playing this. So maybe taking a little bit more time to really internalize that 5-4 groove will take this to the next level. Thanks for submitting. Let's do another one. This one comes from Fouad Azar, a Jordanian musician. Whoa. Quintuplet, swing man. Wave of the future. Beautiful lines, man. I love the doubling between the bass and the synthesizer. It felt very natural. It didn't feel like you were trying to prove anything with it. It just felt like a fun, nice, and interesting melodic line that, you know, just happened to be in quintuplets. I think personally, I think I could have used a more aggressive bass tone, like maybe a touch of saturation and overdrive, something to just give it a little bit more grit so that it sings and projects out a little bit more from the rest of the ensemble. That's totally personal preference. I'm just going with my gut reaction, watching your bass playing. It's really awesome, man. Thank you so much for submitting. I get so excited when I see people who do the quintuplet swing and you know, are really taking this idea, hopefully to the next level. It's a brand new kind of expression. If you haven't checked out my bandmate Sean Crowder's playlist for quintuplet swing, all the examples of this quintuplet style, definitely check that out. The link is in the description. It's just a fun new texture to play with. I love it. So thank you so much for submitting. Let's do maybe one more. This is Tyler Donko Hall, a ukulele player playing a Chady Beck and Domi. All right, let's check this out. One, two, three. Wow. <laughs> Wonky groove. Woo. Damn. Kids these days. Really good. Are you sure you're a ukulele player? Because you got some drum and bass chops there. Like, you're young, and Domi and JD Beck are also young, and there's this whole style of like garage DIY fusion that's just, it's hip as hell. I mean, just on a technique level, one thing that I see that you're doing is you aren't using the pinky finger when you're playing bass, and I strongly recommend that you incorporate the use of the pinky finger rather than rely entirely on the third finger. You see this all the time from people who are switching from guitar to bass, and I'm assuming from ukulele to bass as well. In the long run, that's gonna save potentially strain on your wrist and your fingers, and also help you execute lines more fluidly and more relaxedly. I mean, besides that though, man, this is just, it's so cool. It's just awesome, man. It seems like you have figured out how to get good at music. All the submissions today and the many hundreds of submissions that I received over at it's underscore Adam Neely over at Instagram show a lot of love and a deep abiding passion for music making. It's honestly really inspiring to see everybody express musical thoughts and ideas in a way that's creative and a way that means something not only to themselves, but also hopefully for everybody else who hears it. It's just so incredibly cool to see people dedicated to the craft of music making. You know, you might notice that in a lot of these videos, people are playing in their bedrooms, and that's honestly where everybody starts. You start with your bedroom studio. And there is a resource that I found very useful for recording and mixing in bedrooms that can be found over at 
Skillshare, today's sponsor. There's a class by Young Guru all about recording and mastering songs from home, where it gives great tips on things like how to arrange the furniture in your bedroom to best absorb certain frequencies. It's super useful stuff and super practical stuff. The course is, of course, found on Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes for creatives and curious people on topics including illustration, design, photography, video, music, and many, many more. Most classes are under 60 minutes with short lessons that are manageable for any schedule. And if you're one of the first thousand people to click the link in the description, you'll get the first two months of Skillshare Premium for free. After those two months, if you sign up for the annual plan, it's less than $10 a month. Go check it out if you're looking for ways of potentially getting good at music. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. And thank you so much to everybody who submitted for this series. Go follow me over at Instagram at its underscore Adam Neely to find out when the next round of submissions will occur. This series is so much fun for me. It's honestly kind of overwhelming because so many people submit and so much of it is so good. It's really inspiring to see the next generation of people just go full tilt into music. It's awesome. So. Yeah, good stuff, everybody. Peace.